Just ahead on American Black Journal, a look at the health concerns facing many African American women. We'll talk with a doctor about the alarming statistics that show an overwhelming number of black women are overweight or obese. Plus, the Detroit Training Center is helping prepare residents for jobs that will help rebuild the city. We'll give you the details. That's all coming up next. Eric wants to know, what does DTE Energy do to make Michigan a better place? Rodney can tell you. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint by number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy. Know your own power. When I grow up, when I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be an architectural engineer. A registered nurse. In the law enforcement. A computer scientist. A successful person. Give Michigan's children the chance to aim high with quality early education. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. On this program, we've often talked about the health issues faced by African American men, but today we're turning our attention to the health concerns of black women. Recent data from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has sounded the alarm about obesity in African American women. The department's Office of Minority Health says four out of five African American women are overweight or obese. Studies conducted in 2011 show that black women were 80% more likely to be obese than non-Hispanic white women, and from 2007 until 2010, African American girls were 80% more likely to be overweight than non-Hispanic white girls. Joining me now to talk about these stats and how black women can take charge of their health is Dr. Elaine Arterberry, a radiation oncologist at Sinai Grace Hospital in Detroit. Welcome to American Black oh, Journal. Oh, thanks for having me. So those numbers are really shocking. It's, uh, it's staggering. I mean, 80 to 90% more likely to be overweight than than non-white Hispanic women? Well, it's interesting because those studies are based on body mass index, which uh -huh. is a calculation of height um, and weight. And I think most of them don't take into account that black women have a higher bone density than, uh, white, than women. white women. Right, so their bones actually weigh more. So if you have a black woman at who's 5'5", five, five, at 165 pounds, she's technically, based on her BMI, overweight. Okay. So the, the BMI studies don't totally account so for So they don't really they don't account give you for that. A, as, as accurate a picture. Right. That being said, you still have a high number of black women that are way over 35 BMI, which okay. really puts you in the overweight or obese category. I think it's a number of factors. Um, black women are under a tremendous amount of stress. Right. Um, depending on where they live, may not have access to grocery stores, et cetera. It's, it's multifactorial. It's not as simple as women are eating too much. Right. I mean, that's a simplistic way of <laughs> right. looking at or it. Or not exercising. Or, or not exercising. I think it's multifactorial. Um, and women really have to look at that and, and do self-examination. So many times women are, you know, exercising or get f getting fit to get to a, a family reunion or a, a right. high school right. uh, party. And really you have to look at it as a continuum, it's, it's a, a lifestyle change. Right. It is really not about uh, mm. dieting or right. losing weight. It is about trying to eat healthy all the time. Right? And making small little steps. For example, this month at our hospital we have a campaign that's actually gone um, beyond uh, our hospital system into the Detroit community of no fried food and soda pop for 61 days. Right. Because soda pop consumption, as innocuous as it seems, accounts for up to 40 percent of calories in some people's diets. Sure. So sure. even something as simple as eliminating soda pop may dramatically alter this profile right. for women. Uh, and when we talk about uh, the, the, the obesity, I mean that, that of course leads to higher incidence of all kinds of other oh, negative yeah. It puts you at risk things. for hypertension, for stroke, for kidney disease, for a number, cancer in some cases. It puts you at higher risk. So women really have to take, sit back and look at their lifestyle cho choices that are contributing to obesity. Right. Uh, another, another real high indicator among black women is uh, for breast cancer as well. Oh, right? yeah. It's, it's really interesting. I, I read a study recently that looked at survivors of breast cancer. These uh -huh. are women who have been treated. And those who maintain their BMI, i.e. maintain their weight, 
had a higher survival rate, independent of their stage really? of cancer. So what happens sometimes with breast cancer is people get depressed and they gain weight after diagnosis. Those girls that were able, and those women who were able to maintain their weight even after a diagnosis, had a had an improved survival, which is fascinating. Right, right. And so, uh, but but for black women overall, uh, survival rates for breast cancer are not where they should be. Yeah, the, the survival's not there. What we see is despite adequate treatment, um, black women are twice as likely to die of breast cancer than white women. Part of this is a delay in diagnosis. Right. The women just don't get to the mammograms. And this is independent of insurance status. This is not just women. So it's not that they don't have access, not they everybody. don't use it. They don't use it. People have fear. People say, I don't have a family history. Um, we've had a lot of intention in the media about Angelina Jolie, mm -hmm. who is a, ha, doesn't even have breast cancer, but had the genetic profile. So people feel, well, if I don't have a family history, I'm okay. But people with a familial history, History, a genetic family history are only 3%. Most women have no family history and need to get a routine mammogram after the age of 40 as part of just their routine healthy living. Right. Um, and w w you work uh, in, in oncology. Mm -hmm. How much is diet and weight a part of what you are uh, dealing with your patients about? Well, it sometimes can interfere with the type of care or the choices that we get. Um, we're able to give people, be, depending on their their, ha their body habitus. Some people can't get chemotherapy because their kidneys are bad, they're, over, they're overweight, and it can, can change the dynamic for right. their treatment. So it's, but most importantly, getting a mammogram, being mindful of your own health is probably the biggest thing I can tell women, and not to have that fear, yeah. just to go ahead and get it done. Right. So, so the stats I was uh, talking about in the open, uh, mm -hmm. some of them were about uh, girls, uh, not, oh, yeah. not women. How much of this is something that starts uh, when you're young and then carries over into adulthood? Well, this is a, sort of a recent phenomena we've seen in our community. My mother went to Howard University, mm -hmm. and she said when she graduated from Howard, nobody was overweight. Right. So in one right. generation, We've seen this whole change. Right. It could be a couple of things. One is the introduction of high fructose corn syrup into the American diet. In, into everything, right? Into it's everything. In everything we right. you buy at the exactly. grocery store. Exactly. So what happened is sugar is so expensive to manufacture and produce, and corn syrup, which is actually cheaper, is in widespread use in a lot of products. And some people feel it's the use of the corn syrup, not the cane sugar. So I tell patients, whenever possible, use some. If you're going to have some sugar, have regular have sugar. Have regular sugar, right? Which of course it, it sort of goes against what you think exactly. uh, you're supposed to do. And what we know for high, fru high fructose corn syrup with uh, breast cancer is that people feel that that may be also a trigger. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. And that's, that's increasing your, your Potentially likelihood. Potentially increasing your likelihood. Okay. And we tell women who have breast cancer or you know, who have a family history at least to avoid the use of high fructose corn syrup. It's in everything. You just have to turn the, the bottle over. And, and again, right. uh, diet soda, I mean sodas, excuse me, have a, have a high incidence of high fructose corn syrup. So we tell people to avoid that. Plus I tell people as sort of cancer prevention is to eat fruits and vegetables, have a very balanced diet, and avoid anything that comes in a yellow, blue, or pink packet. Oh, why is that? Um, there is some animal data that suggests that some of those products can contribute to cancer risk. Okay, okay. Um, it's been seen in animals, not in humans, but even, even so, the biggest thing is to try to avoid anything processed. You know, if right. basically... Eat natural food. Natural foods. Okay. And when you think about it, if one generation ago, our, our parents were eating off the farm. Right. They got sweet potatoes, everybody had a garden, even in, in uh, industrial areas. Yeah. And that's sort of, you know, sort of lost. Right. So that people should try to get food in the most natural phase possible. How, how hard is it in cities like Detroit where, uh, you know, uh, the, just the, the lack of density now uh, really has emptied out so much of the city uh, in terms of commerce, uh, grocery, those kind of things. How hard is it really to get that message across to women that you've got to eat better, you've got to watch your I think weight? it's huge, be huge because of the availability. I mean, until very recently, we didn't have a large national grocery store chain in the city of well, Detroit. Right. They were right. all on the perimeters until right. very recently where Whole Foods came to the came to the table right. and it's been a huge success, even surprising to many people in the community, how successful it would be and how people would be desirous of food that was natural right. and without chemicals. And I think a lot of people, it's interesting when you talk about Whole Foods, a lot of people think, well that's just some sort of high-end fancy grocery store. 
it's actually uh, just a natural grocery store. Basically. It's a place where you're not going to find products with uh, a high fructose uh, corn right. syrup. Right, you don't have to make the things. choices. It's right. already made it's for you. It's all right there. Yeah, right. exactly. So I encourage people. Additionally, we didn't have a lot of farmer's markets. When you go into the suburban areas of Detroit, there's farmer's markets. and All and, over the right. place. Right, so now Detroit is starting to evolve in that way, where instead of just having Eastern Market, there's individual neighborhoods that are developing farmer's market. And I think that's a huge shift towards people understanding that they need to eat natural food and unprocessed food, it'll help with their long-term longevity as well as weight control. Right. Uh, one of the things you mentioned earlier was that that stress is one of the real contributors oh, yeah. to that. There's not much, it seems like you can you can do about that, right? Well, probably the biggest thing you can do for stress is exercise, which ties into weight. I think it's important that people maintain a regular exercise regimen. I mean, the rules are 30 minutes, five days a week. That may be hard to do, but you can do a walking That's a regimen. Lot. That's a lot. I mean, that's what people say. So, but. People have to change their lifestyle a little bit at a time. I don't think you can do these broad things. Yeah. Like right now, I'm on no fried food and soda pop, along with about 4,000 people at my hospital. Right. <laughs> and we're having a huge challenge, and people are doing it. I mean, there's a sticky, people are emptying, are not emptying the soda pop do you think, vending machine but, anymore. So if you do something like that, though, how, how likely is it that you stick with it, even beyond what your, well, your challenge is. What they say about habits is if you can do anything for 21 days, you can keep it up okay. for a long period of time. So it's really getting over that three week hump. It's that three week, okay. And once you do that, generally you can stick with it and it becomes it can become part of your lifestyle. Right. What would you say is the, the, the best thing you could tell young girls uh, about this, this issue so that they don't get started down that road? Of, uh, One thing I can tell young girls is to inform themselves about what their correct body weight should be. And looking at the BMI tables is, is good, recognizing that because you have a slightly higher bone weight, and I mean five to eight pounds, it's right. not 20 pounds so, extra, right, right. that you're going to be within that range. You should shoot for those ranges. Additionally, is to really start thinking about an exercise program that you can maintain for life. Is it walking? Is it jogging? Is it going with your friends to an being exercise active, class? And being normally. active and trying to incorporate that activity as part of your lifestyle. Not just buying a tape and doing it for three weeks <laughs> and then getting tired, but find something that you can enjoy and that you can do for a lifetime. Okay. Well, th uh, great to have you here. It's a pleasure. Thank Very you so much. important information. Just ahead on American Black Journal. Uh, Detroit Agency is helping to reduce unemployment by retraining residents for jobs in the city. We'll tell you about the Detroit Training Center next. The Detroit Training Center is helping residents prepare the, for the workforce by providing customized vocational training. Students get hands-on experience in construction, landscaping, and facility maintenance. The center partners with contractors, businesses, and nonprofit organizations to help graduates find job opportunities. After just one year of existence, the program has been very successful. 92% of the graduates have found work. Here to talk about the Detroit Training Center is Director Marcus Jones. He's joined by one of the center's students, Alvin Hicks. Welcome to American Black Journal. So this is this is a great idea uh, and, and something that is really focused on one of Detroit's biggest problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the Detroit Training Center, we started about a year ago um, with the sole purpose to help um, put Detroit residents back to work and to increase the number of jobs and job opportunities in the city of Detroit. Right, uh, and, and as you say, I mean, that's this is this is issue number one mm -hmm. in most neighborhoods uh, that that number one, there aren't enough jobs uh, for people to work, but number two, uh, that people aren't don't have the 
right training for right. the jobs that may be available. Right. So traditionally, we've seen a lot of companies, um, they get contracts um, from the city government, the state, the federal government, um, and there were requirements to hire um, local residents from the city. Right. However, cities have traditionally said, well, there aren't enough um, skilled um, individuals in the city of Detroit and tend to bring in workers from um, suburban areas into the city. Um, and what, says, what that has done is created a situation to where all the money um, and jobs that could be going into it the leaves. city um, is leaving the city and going back into the suburbs. And that's where we have these situations with um, you know, lack of tax revenue for the city and uh, lack of um, individuals in neighborhoods with stable jobs. Right, right. Uh, and so you're one of the, the students at the, at the training center. Tell me about your experience there. Well, there at the DTC, it's been great for me. I've learned a lot of things. I've got, I've gotten a lot of great opportunities from that. Uh, I try to put myself out there so that I can do anything, volunteer work, so that I can put my name out there so that I can try to get jobs. Yeah. What, what part of the city uh, do you live in? I live on the west side of Detroit. Okay. And in and, and your area, uh, how, how hard is it to find stable work? Very, very hard. Yeah. Uh, basically, there's jobs that come through. You see the people there, the construction jobs, but I don't see any African Americans out there on the job sites. Right. So uh, evidently, they're going out further, recruiting to find to people and 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 bring them in. And that's got to. I mean, uh, do you feel like that's because they can't find people in the city to do those jobs, or? I think it's because they're not searching hard enough to find. To find them. Because there's places like DTC that does just that. Right. Train for the construction field. Right. How, how did you pick the uh, the areas that you guys are focusing on in terms of landscaping and construction? And uh, is that the 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 place that you feel like there are the most job opportunities? Well, when we started the company, uh, we all had um, backgrounds um, that overlapped in one of the, the fields, either construction or landscaping, um, facility maintenance, and you know some heavy equipment um, experience. And we knew that those were good paying jobs for individuals. You know, um, you know, there's a strong push for uh, people to go to college and get a four year degree and come sure. out to be accountants and doctors and, uh, and everything like that. And that's great. However, um, there are a number of uh, people that aren't um, college ready and don't want to go to college. They have to provide for their families now. Right. And so we know that um, with short term training programs, they can get out to work and they can become productive citizens a lot quicker. Yeah. And uh, we knew that um, a lot of people wanted to work with their hands. Detroit is a skillful city. Right. People have been working with their hands since Detroit was that's built. A, that's how the city grew up. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And yeah. we need more people in those fields because those are traits that are getting lost now. Um, and so we realized that there is going to be a shortage and that um, the same people that we can train to not only work on these jobs can also be the same ones who help um, remove blight from their own blocks in their, in their communities. Right, right. So, so tell me about the kind of employment opportunities you've found since you've gone to DTC. Well, uh, I've done volunteer work for uh, HGTV uh, program, uh, removal, removal of asbestos. Uh -huh. uh, I've done uh, several demolitions in major businesses downtown. Uh -huh. uh, I've also assisted with uh, Chase when they had that fire down there recently. Uh, it's been great opportunities. Uh, Without that, I would have been on my own trying to find employment through word of mouth, things yeah. of that nature, yeah. which has been successful as well, <laughs> right, but right. not as successful as things have been. So what was your work life like before you went to DTC? I mean, tell me how you found jobs, uh, how, how often it was, uh, you know, you were able to find steady work. Well, basically, I was uh, also in Michigan Works. They uh -huh. assisted me uh, with job employment. I drove truck. Uh, cross country for about a couple years uh -huh. and things of that nature. Uh, home improvement has been things that I've been doing for quite some time and I do something for someone and they tell the next person that hey sure. he does a good job and they see what I've done. <laughs> right. like, is he expensive? Right, and give you a chance, and right? Give you a chance. Yeah. What, what about in your neighborhood? I mean, are most of the people in your neighborhood uh, finding steady work? Um, no, not really. I mean, there's a lot of different things 
in my neighborhood, I mean, the houses are abandoned. It's horrible, yeah. uh, to be quite honest. Yeah. Uh, but there's guys that's willing to work and trying to work but can't find employment. And that's another thing. They need to find a place where someone's willing to give them a chance to go out there and do something. Right. Right. Uh, it seems like one of the key uh, ingredients here is stability, that, that you're trying to, to get that sort of employment stability for people who, who can't really find it on their own. Correct. And that's where we come into play is we, we help give them skills um, and give them credentials um, because we're living in a day and age where credentials on your resume are um, really how you get past the gatekeeper. And then from there we work with the soft skills, so showing up to work on time, um, being professional, dressing for success, thinking positive. Right. Um, w those skills are the ones that keep you on the job um, and allow you to advance uh, to a higher paying and higher, um, you know, a higher positions on right. the job site. Right. Um, so it's a combination of, of different things to, that are keys to success. Um, but the main one is just believing um, in that individual and working collaboratively with uh, community stakeholders to uh, really um, instill in that person that they can be successful and contribute to society. Right. So, so you've placed 92% of the graduates mm -hmm. uh, in a job. Tell me about some of the some of the places that they're that they're working. Some of the businesses who are who are helping mm -hmm. place them in work. Well. Um, a couple of good businesses, Hamtramck Recycling um, in Hamtramck, um, um, Michigan, they um, have hired uh, over 20 something uh, residents from either Detroit or Hamtramck and we've trained um, the workers at their facility to um, not only meet the requirements um, set by federal regulations to work in that facility, but um, also provide them with opportunities for advancement. So teaching them different heavy equipment skills, um, teaching individual safety supervisor positions. Um, and so that's one um, company. Uh, we also work with a national landscaping company, uh -huh. Davy Tree, um, which is nationally recognized. They do big projects all over the United States. Um, and we had two guys, um, uh, who had uh, some troubles in their background. Yeah. Um, and now, um, given the opportunity, these guys are now supervisors. Once started uh, over the summer as a, just a crew member, and now they're running crews. Um, and so we've had um, various areas of success, you know, from construction to facilities to heavy equipment, um, you know, all over. Right. Uh, you mentioned something there about uh, people who've had a little trouble uh, in their past. That's one of the real barriers to, oh, yeah. to, to getting work in Detroit because we have so many people who, mm -hmm. who have records. Right, right? exactly. Um, and so we uh, work with individuals from all different walks of life and with background issues. Uh, what we advocate for is we sit down with employers um, and with different companies and we, we talk about the different background barriers and we see which companies are willing to hire those with um, certain background issues. And we work with the students who have these barriers um, to help them overcome um, some of these issues by providing them those additional skills on right. um, both the technical skills and the soft skills um, because you can't do one or the other you have to do both um, and from there you'll see that these guys who have been uh, recently recently returned home are some of the hardest working guys out there and they want to they want to work exactly yeah. exactly yeah um, and how 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 tolerant are you finding the employers of those issues because that I mean the issue often is that employers want to say, well, we can't take people uh, who've had that issue before. Well, that is uh, one of the great things about the industries that we work in. Uh, a lot of companies are more lenient um, to individuals with background issues, and yeah. so we work with a lot of background-friendly companies, um, whereas, you know, if we're dealing with um, an office environment or a general contractor that works in, um, you know, a, a medical facility, then, you know, there becomes that challenge. But a lot of these projects, um, we're working on um, the Department of Transportation, and so we can have individuals working on our highways and on our bridges and right. different things like that. Right. Uh, what area of the city do you feel like you're having the most uh, the, the most, most impact? impact. On? Um, I would say we're we're all over the city, but the North End. Uh, we work with 
uh, a number of entities up that way. Uh -huh. um, the Michigan Urban Farm Initiative. We teach classes um, at an urban um, farm, um, teaching landscape um, landscape courses. And so we we go in, um, we help um, turn over land and help get land prepared to grow fresh crops and fresh produce. Um, and so Which I was is addressing another need, right? exactly. <laughs> and so uh, when we can have those spillover benefits, yeah. um, I feel like we're not only impacting the individuals that we're helping getting the job, but we're also um, promoting Move healthy lifestyles. Okay. Right. All right. Well, great work and great to have you guys here. All right. Thank you for having us. Recently on American Black Journal, we featured the Jim Crow Museum, which is located at Ferris State University in Big Rapids. The museum will be highlighted in this Tuesday's episode of the PBS series, The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. The six-part series is written and hosted by Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Here's a preview of part four. Next time on The African Americans, Jim Crow laws offer new challenges. We're going to show that separate but equal is not going to stop us from being successful. We can build our own businesses. We can support our own industry. The African Americans, many rivers to cross. Be sure to tune in to The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. right here on Detroit Public Television. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's show and get your ideas for future topics. So connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time on American Black Journal. wants to know. What does DTE Energy do to make Michigan a better place? Rodney can tell you. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint by number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy. Know your own power. When I grow up, when I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be an architectural engineer. A registered nurse. In the law enforcement. A computer scientist. A successful person. Give Michigan's children the chance to aim high with quality early education.